All right, welcome everybody to one of the first parallel sessions of this year's ASCLYCC conference. This parallel session will be focused on regulatory tools in comparative perspective. We have uh, five different papers today that we're going to hear from, and they are uh, we're already running a little low on schedule, so I'll cut the preliminary marks to make it as short as possible. Um, I'll just state that in terms of process, each speaker will have, um, hopefully they can keep to 15 minutes so that will provide us with the time for questions. Uh, if you go a little over that, I won't stop you, but if you're getting close to 20, I am going to just flat out start talking over you. So uh, please keep that in mind. And then what we'll do is we'll do all the papers and then we'll hopefully they'll speak to each other in a way that will allow us to ask questions that we can put to the panel more broadly. So without any further ado, let's start things off with Malavika Parthasarathi's paper, Think Soft, the Reputational Value of Soft Law. Um, hi, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak at the conference. Um, I'm just going to be sharing my screen. Um, so I'm Malvika. I'm an academic and teaching fellow of private international law at National Law University, Delhi. So um, in my paper, I study, I use states as a framing device to understand how corporations use soft law to restore reputation in the wake of a reputationally damaging event. I look at two case studies that are beyond petroleum and Nestle. And um, I find that sustained publicity, the recognition of the importance of reputation and the ability to craft a compelling organizational narrative are factors that influence the ability of a corporation to use soft law to its advantage. I also look at the limitations of the ways in which corporations use soft law. So soft law is a non-binding legal instrument, the violation of which leads to political rather than legal consequences. What's interesting, however, is that soft law is largely complied with. Examples of soft law include declarations, resolutions, and programs of action. Both in the context of states and corporations, soft law shows that they commit to certain values. It enhances cooperation, um, it provides for flexibility, allows for rapid responses, and engages the international community. Importantly, and in the context of this paper, I study the role of soft law as a tool to build and restore reputation. So um, the question that arises is why I am comparing states and corporations. Um, well, both are beholden to a range of stakeholders, some of whom overlap. Um, states are beholden to international organizations, the press, other countries, amongst other stakeholders, and corporations are accountable to shareholders, consumers, governments, etc. Both states and corporations are concerned with reputation, and both use soft law. So they use soft law as a tool to build and restore reputations, and they look similar. The manner in which they use soft law looks similar at a formal level, but can be different in some ways. So how does soft law influence reputation? Well, in the context of international relations, reputation is the world's belief in a state's future behavior based on observations of its past behavior. Soft law in such a situation may seem uh, may serve as a stamp of approval. Um, an example of soft law is Mexico's legalization of NAFTA to sort of win investor approval. A study was conducted um, about the sort of deliberations that took place at the UN General Assembly by Bangladesh and other nations. The study compared the sort of interactions between Bangladesh and other countries and how they negotiated over declarations of the UN General Assembly and how that sort of built reputation. That is just an example of how states interact with each other over drafting a soft law and how that seems to build reputation in one another's eyes. Withdrawing from soft law also comes with reputational consequences, an example of which was the US withdrawing from the Paris Agreement under President Trump, um, which led to not so great reputational consequences. And then the reversal of this withdrawal under President Biden, which was sort of, which helped build the US reputation, rebuild the US's reputation slightly. Um, 
So in the context of corporations, the firm's reputation can be built and reinforced by commitment to social values. And these social values can be sort of reflected in a soft law instrument. The soft law, as we saw in the case of states, could become a prerequisite for carrying out business. Um, network effects could come into play. A network is a effect is basically when a corporation or a soft law adopts, or a corporation or a state adopts a soft law. And the more states and corporations adopt that particular soft law, the more valuable it becomes. Non-compliance, even in the case of corporations, could lead to negative reputational consequences. So I look at two case studies that of Beyond Petroleum and Nestle. So BP, uh, or Beyond Petroleum, really managed to re-engineer its image from that of an oil company that uh, was responsible for a host of environmental violations to a company that looks um, somewhat like this, a company that seems to care about uh, the environment. So um, BP has an interesting story. Um, initially, it was part of something called the GCC, which was a group of organizing group of corporations, including BP, Shell, Exxon, Mobil, um, Ford, all of these evil guys, who opposed mandatory limits on carbon emissions. So they launched multi-million dollar campaigns to push back against the Kyoto Protocol, which was a hard law that sought to limit carbon emissions. Eventually, BP left the GCC, and this was followed by Shell. So um, the, oil, the oil industry is oligopolistic and there is a lot of emulation of one another's moves. So it makes sense that Shell left after BP. This was subsequently followed by a host of organizations that left the GCC. BP then began to express a changed attitude to climate policy. And in 2001, changed its name from British Petroleum to Beyond Petroleum. In 2010, um, as we all know, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill took place where BP released millions of gallons of oil into the Gulf of Mexico, which, um, threat, which sort of uh, destroyed the fragile marine ecosystem there and led to the death of 11 workers. This dealt a massive blow to BP's reputation. However, it tried to re-engineer a turnaround in its image. And in 2012, it started something called the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, which was very different from the earlier GCC. So this initiative um, sort of supports the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement is basically a soft law. Um, again, um, sort of dealing with uh, limits on carbon emissions. So if you go to the BP website right now, you see that they have an entire tab dedicated to how they support the Paris Agreement called Reimagining Energy. In 2020, they said that they would stop oil and gas exploration. This led to a huge jump in share value. BP now seems to embrace soft regulation in the form of the Paris Agreement. Uh, the members of the OGCI seem to be emulating BP's model and they all proclaim their commitment to Paris Agreement. So what BP and a lot of oil companies do right now is that they stop short of supporting hard regulation, but they seem to sort of give the appearance of strongly supporting soft law in the form of the Paris Agreement. Network effects have come into play and nearly all oil companies now uh, support the Paris Agreement. So it sort of changed the currency for doing business in the oil industry. And um, if you look at the sort of uh, narratives that BP and a lot of oil companies are using, they use traces like the common heritage of mankind. This is actually mirroring the language of a lot of uh, environmental soft law instruments. So, why do, they, why do states and corporations use soft law? Well, soft law serves as a signaling mechanism and drives beliefs about future behavior. In the case of states, the role of social networks comes into the picture. Um, and if you look at the cost of compliance, there's something known as the low discount rate that comes into the picture. A low discount rate basically shows other players that the state or corporation is willing to sacrifice the immediate high cost of compliance in expectation of uh, future returns. So this sort of creates a better reputation and trust amongst other players. So with the BP case, BP generated a lot of positive press by supporting the Paris Agreement. And this also led to better cooperation with other oil companies. Um, network effects, mirroring, and the evidence of low discount rate seem to improve the reputation of BP. 
There's also a push towards standardization where BP and other oil companies are um, sort of accept the Paris Agreement as some sort of threshold. The soft law standard, which is the Paris Agreement, has now become exponentially more valuable. And departure from these standards, I'm guessing, would come with some reputational costs. Um, another facet of reputational studies that hasn't so far been explored as much is something called organizational stigma. Organizational stigma is somewhat different from reputation. So stigma is a devalued social identity. Um, and the core values of the stigmatized group of organizations are different from the values of the stakeholder group. An example of organizational stigma would be the kind of attitudes expressed towards banks and other financial institutions in the wake of the 2008 economic crisis. So stigma isn't the same as a bad reputation. A bad reputation could attach to a single organization, whereas stigma generally um, attaches to a group of organizations. So generally what happens in a case where an organization is stigmatized is that um, it recognizes its stigma and attempts to apologize to the audience of normals. So an example of a state that um, was heavily, a state and a group of states actually that were heavily stigmatized in the wake of uh, the second world war was Germany and the other Axis powers. So Germany subsequently attempted to come to terms with its Nazi past um, it joined the common European currency um, despite the higher value of its Deutschmark. Um, it participated in EU common security policies, the UN and NATO military missions, and it engaged in the dialogue with its historical burden. Um, it didn't really use soft law. We'll probably come to why it didn't use soft law um, sometime later in the presentation. Nestle, on the other hand, is a corporation that has very, very successfully used soft law to shed stigma. So uh, Nestle is known is one of the largest players in the food and beverage industry and has committed scores of human rights and environmental violations in developing countries. So one of the earliest scandals that uh, Nestle was involved in was in the 1970s for the unethical marketing of infant formula. A British NGO called the War on Want published uh, an informational pamphlet about the formula industry's marketing practices. The pamphlet was called The Baby Killer. Um, this led to the stigmatization of the formula industry as a whole. A boycott was launched against Nestle. And um, eventually there was a lot of pressure by civil society and um, the international media. And the WHO evolved a code for the marketing of breast milk substitutes. Nestle was forced to endorse the code. Uh, Nestle and other formula industry uh, players were forced to endorse the code. But today, if you go to the Nestle website and you look at the kind of articles that Nestle is putting out there, Nestle seems to show that it was like an active adopter of the code. Ne Nestle acknowledges the boycott um, in its own way. So when you actually Google Nestle boycott, Nestle's own narrative about the boycott comes up first. So it's crafted its own narrative around the boycott and highlights its commitment to the WHO code, which is a form of soft law. It thus engages in a dialogue with the past. It's developed its own company policy, which um, is supposed to be more stringent than the code. It comes out with annual reports detailing compliance and accepts accountability. So Nestle sort of tries to distinguish itself from other infant formula manufacturers. So it invokes this soft law repeatedly. Um, it uses the WHO code as a sort of fulcrum for its stigma recognition efforts, and it performs to the audience of normals. Uh, Nestle, soon after adopting the code, saw a rapid uh, growth in profits. Again, with network effects, um, the WHO code has now become a sort of uh, prerequisite for being a part of the formula industry. So states haven't really used uh, soft law to shed stigma. The adoption of soft law may not be enough. Um, for instance, in the case of the Axis powers uh, in the wake of World War II, uh, adoption of soft law may not have been uh, enough to sort of displace stigma. A drastic character shift would have worked better, worked better. The characteristics of stigmatizers in both cases is also different. In the case of states, uh, other states are the primary stigmatizers, whereas in the case of corporations, it's usually consumers that are the stigmatizers. Adoption of soft law might be sufficient um, for consumers, but not so for states. Um, 
So corporations have used soft law. And this use of soft law is determined in large part by its ability to generate publicity. Um, corporations also sort of uh, show their willingness to comply with the terms of soft law. In the case of Nestle, Nestle was able to com craft a compelling organizational narrative, engaging in a dialogue with its past. It also strongly highlighted its compliance with the court, which is a form of soft law. Um, it basically seized the narrative. BP did something very similar. It highlighted its commitment to the Paris Agreement through publicity. Um, in fact, BP recently came out with an article that was written by the CEO of BP, uh, along with a very high functionary of the UNFCCC, which is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, strange bedfellows writing an article together about how um, the oil industry could um, support the Paris Agreement. So BP has created enormous publicity about its support for the Paris Agreement um, and ties its entire new identity as an energy company rather than an oil company around its support for the Paris Agreement. So there are some limitations uh, to how corporations can use soft law. Uh, one is that some smaller corporations might suffer. They may just not have the capacity to publicize their adoption of soft law, and they may not even have the capacity to ensure compliance. So um, once the soft law becomes a worldwide or industry-wide standard, it's difficult for a corporation or a state to not comply. So consequences are stark for both states and corporations. In the case of states, this includes weakening of economic ties, decrease in aid, refusal of future cooperation by other states. And this may also sort of flow from third parties like um, international organizations. So similar consequences uh, attach to non-compliance in the case of corporations, like a severely tarnished reputation. In the case of Nestle, we saw a boycott. Um, financial consequences, and smaller corporations are thus in a double bind because uh, it costs a lot of money to comply. And when they, but the consequences of non-compliance are huge. So it's, it's severely limiting for a small corporation. But overall soft law has been used by both states and corporations as a sort of fulcrum to center its reputation management efforts. So this, all of these factors like the network effects which make the soft law standard exponentially more valuable. This clarifies standards and triggers large scale compliance. But just adopting the soft law cannot be the only thing that changes. There needs to be a compelling organizational narrative and a reclamation of the past. Um, perceived compliance is also important. Um, future research should probably look at, um, I would like to see future research in the area of non-compliance in the case of corporations, the effects of non-compliance. But as of now, um, this was my presentation. So thank you for your time. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, that was interesting. Uh, we will now, in the interest of time, move on. Let's do the clap thing um, on the camera and uh, hear from Jesse Liu, who will be presenting regulatory approaches to solutions on disinformation controversies in Taiwan. So, hello everyone, can you see my screen? Not yet? Okay, let me. Okay, you can hear on voice, right? Okay, okay. Yeah, nice to see you Oh, Sorry, it's a little bit late here. So the light is, is a little bit, you know, dark, but yeah, today I'm, I'm, it's my pleasure to discuss the issue about this information uh, today. I, I came from Taiwan from National Zhengzhou University. Okay, so I think I have to say this information is a very traditional issue. Many people think this is a brand new issue, brand new issue, but it actually is, is not. Because I think this kind of issue is about the audience misled by the, some kind of absurd propaganda. Okay, let me try to, okay. And this kind of propaganda or maybe information will have, have will let the audience have wrong thoughts and further make a, some kind of inappropriate judgments. So actually he damaged the public interest and result in some kind of democratic failure. So actually from some cases you can see, actually this information, just like I say, is very traditional issue. For example, when the Titanic had some kind of accident, 
a newspaper say all the passengers are saved, but this is not true. And some people even believing uh, Hillary Clinton adopts alien baby because there are so many disinformation, even in the printed media. Okay, but so many people think this is some kind of new issue, but actually th this is not. It's a, a very traditional way to try to attract it, attract the, the attract attract the, the audience and try to increase the profit. Okay, so what kind of new issue we should uh, think about is about the social media. Because actually when the social media came out, you know, everyone can be the, can be the, uh, can establish some kind of ch channel and try to, you know, deliver the information to everyone. So everyone can got enough resources to influence the, the whole society. And I can say the rise of social media not only change the market of le legacy media, but also changes the way people receive information. Also, you can see uh, now actually it's quite different because there are so many, I, I would say YouTuber, they are not professional. So they, have, they don't have that kind of capability to deliver the correct information, even write very professional articles. So this is the, the problem why the information, the disinformation issue is so serious now because the market is totally different. Okay. And, okay. and I think the AI and the, the robot issue is also a very critical issue at this, this kind of internet and digital era because the social robots are often manipulated by humans. So, uh, some company can use this kind of the robot to produce more disinformation. And they can break the ge geographical limitation, build a, a widespread in influence and circulating some kind of fake news online. Okay, and you can see actually now people don't trust the, the, the news anymore because there are so many fake, in, fake news and there are so many social robots maybe on Facebook or maybe on uh, maybe IG, Instagram, something like this. So we can see there are so many new issues because of social media and AI. So, but I have to say, I would like to share three very important points with you uh, by Professor Tim Wu. Tim Wu say this is some kind of, um, I would say the, the competition issue in the market because in this kind of digital era, the audience can be confused in the huge amount of information and fail to, fails to find useful information which they can receive. In the, in the, in the past, you, are very, you can very easy to receive correct information. You can listen to the, the radio and you can watch the TV, but now it's really hard because we always try to get information from the social media. Okay, so we cannot, get a pretty good approach to reach the correct information. And uh, the second point is about, uh, just like I say, the, the, now everyone just use the social media to receive the information. So the minority's opinions will fade away in the information exposure because people's opinions are unable to remain competitive in the speech market. Okay, so truths are more easy blocked and lost their compat, com, uh, capability to enter the market. Okay, so we can say this is some kind of monkey failure here. The third point is about now, just like I say, there are so many social robots now in the market. They try to create so many fake news. And in the past, just the government has that kind of power to try to control the market, to try to, to deliver the, the, the information everyone should receive. But now I think it's a little bit different. Everyone can deliver your thoughts and maybe your ideas and very easily because the social media become more powerful. So not everything is controlled by the government anymore. Everyone can have that kind of power. So we can say the private corporation are more powerful now, right? Because now they got a microphone, they can speak out their, their thoughts more easily. 
So, so just like I say, now this information is a very serious, serious problem because now people, the young generation all, always depend on the social media to receive information. Just the elder people still listen to the radio and maybe watch the TV program on the TV. So, you know, so you can see the audience are able to immediately receive correct information. And many people even just don't care because they think we, I got so many information from the social media just for entertainment. You know, there's no, no, no real news anymore because you know, we don't care, we just don't care because there are so many fake news now. Okay, so you can see actually now some, uh, based on some statistic, you can see the Facebook and uh, they always try to decline people's political participation because they think now it's more important to entertain the people, not, tr not try to produce professional news because this, that's not a market. You know, you cannot earn any profit from that. Okay, so what kind of regulations we can have at this kind of situation? Okay, so I think basically there are three kinds of approaches we can depend on. The first one is about how we try to control the, 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 the uh, I mean the platform. Okay, the second one is about can we really control, the, 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 regulate the, the content? The third one is about the consumer protection. Maybe I think it's more about education. Okay, so the first one is about content regulation is the most widely adopted model because the corporation always can set up the, 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 the everything, you know, they can get the data pretty easily. So if they try to stop the fake news, it's more easy for, it's the easiest way to do that, to do this. And you can see, but, but the problem is now, I think the, 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 second, the second approach is, is not allowed it because in general, people like US, the first amendment thing, the, the, on the basis of the first amendment, the US government should avoid, uh, I mean, preventing bias to a specific type of expression even if the content is completely incorrect. So even you say something wrong, I should give you the right to speak out. So that's why we cannot just regulate the content. Okay, so just like I say, the, 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 to regulate the, the, the platform is more efficient, but now in every country, it's impossible to regulate the content directly. Okay, and so actually, yeah, just like I say, the US always think you can, you, you should take a pretty neutral position to show shorter all, all types of speech, okay. So, uh, but I think in the US, they are trying to correct their, their viewpoints a little bit. For example, you, you all know Donald Trump will try to, you know, encourage some people to go enter the, 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 the uh, you know, go to the DC and try to kill so many people there. So Twitter just tried to block uh, Donald Trump's, you know, uh, I, I mean, they, they, his words on the Twitter because there are some kind of very urgent situation. You still need to regulate content. So now the US tried to, you know, pass the, 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 the some kind of new uh, CDA, Communication Desensing Dis Act because the, Sometimes, you know, because about the vi violence, maybe about the children's uh, mental or physical health, you still need to do something, okay? Not just about the net neutrality, like the, the professor Tim would say in the, in the past. So this is some news I would like to share with you. And now actually in the Europe, uh, in Germany, they also pass a new law called Network Enforcement Act try to regulate the online platform to monitor and re remove content uh, concerning violation of public interest and private interests. So in some very specific situation, now some country think we can regulate content directly. Okay. Okay, this is also about the, the German. And the third, 
The third point I, I would like to share with you is uh, besides of content regulation and platform regulation, the third approach is about education. Now, so many countries try to depend on fact-checking system to deal with uh, this information issue. Okay, so uh, because I came from Taiwan, maybe some of you know Taiwan is very close to China. So I think because Chinese government think Taiwan is one part of Taiwan, it's one, Taiwan is one part of China. But actually many people in Taiwan think Taiwan is a country. So uh, I would say before the presidential election, every time, Chinese people will send so many information, maybe disinformation to Taiwan and try to you know, support some specific candidates to win the election and try to promote more policy to help Chinese government. So there are so many protests in Taiwan. Yeah, and we are trying to avoid this kind of disinformation issue in Taiwan. Okay, so Taiwan now we are trying to, uh, because Taiwan is a free country with freedom of expression. So now we are trying to establish more organize fact checking system. For example, we have a foundation and try to develop this kind of skill and technologies. Okay. And this is the, yeah, we have learned the, the first uh, Taiwan fact checking center. So uh, this foundation is so successful because in 2010, we have our presidential election. And when there's a presidential debate, the fact checking center try to, you know, check every information by the candidates. And because there are three candidates there, we found some candidates just try to submit some maybe incorrect information and try to win more votes. Okay, so uh, I would say the, the, the disinformation issue in Taiwan is quite serious, but because we have very good uh, fact checking system. So at in 2010, the, the, the vote, uh, the election was, wasn't uh, affected by uh, disinformation in Taiwan because we have different kind of system try to help people to make a, a correct decision. Okay, so this is some kind of data I would like to show you. Yeah, you can see there are three candidates and we found some candidates just try to deliver some fake news and you know maybe disinformation. And, and people can make a more precise de uh, decision and try to, we, we can say this kind of system maybe try to safeguard our democratic system in Taiwan, okay. So the last one I would like to share with you is about the internal system. Now Facebook tried to establish a new approaches to deal with uh, this information issue. So, they established some kind of uh, global oversight board. So now they hire so many experts from the world and one from Taiwan. And if the Facebook has some kind of issue, try to delete some uh, critical message or some kind of more, you know, uh, and, and, and you can, you know, there's, it's like some kind of judicial system. You can appeal your case. And they will send the case into the oversight board. And they will try to depend on all kinds of perspective and try to make a decision to announce if we keep the information still there or maybe we just delete it. Okay. So I think uh, in my paper, I would like to share something very different because I think in the past we have some very traditional principle to deal with the problem in legacy media, for example, in radio station and maybe in TV programs. For example, mass carry doctrine. Yeah, mass carry doctrine forces cable system loading significant TV program related to significant social warfare on national policy. For example, uh, in Taiwan, we think baseball is so important. So the government will uh, enforce the, the cable system to load all baseball games so we can watch the baseball game. Even the TV station then didn't earn any profits. The, the government just, you know, we have this kind of policy. But, but this kind of policy is all about the, the, the cable, the signal, 
because the signal is so limited. But now we came to, now it's the internet and digital era, you know. The resources is, so, is, is quite enough to everyone to share your information. So we don't need this kind of traditional rule to limit to, to, because of the limited resources. So I think for me, I wish you apply a different kind of model and try to address the disinformation issue in the, inter in the internet era, or maybe you can say a digital era. Okay, so, okay, so, sorry, because I don't have much time. So uh, I think that's point I would like to share with you. Is now Taiwan tried to set up a new law about this information, but I think it's very important. We need to know how to identify, check, and uh, we. I think ed education is still a very important uh, way we address the disinformation issue. But the problem is in Taiwan, the government tried to set up some kind of educational system to teach people how to identify this is, is disinformation. But the problem is sometimes you didn't stand in a very neutral position because you know in Taiwan, some people support China, some people support Taiwan. So how to create some kind of more neutral curriculum for this kind of education, I think is a very important issue for us. Okay, so uh, in Taiwan now, we don't think we need a, a law to regulate this information, but we think maybe for example, about the infrastructure, uh, about the, the, the agriculture industry, sometimes the information will make some kind of negative effect to the price. So we can put some kind of article about this information in, um, in some kind of specific industry, but we don't need a, a very general law to regulate the disinformation issue because it causes our freedom of expression, or maybe he caused some kind of negative effect to our democratic uh, system. So today I think, uh, yeah, this is my presentation. I would like, I just want to share some experience from Taiwan. And because this is a, a paper, a draft I just finished. So I looking forward to your questions and any thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, we'll now move on to a paper that uh, Prabhupada Singh has written with a co-author who unfortunately it looks like was unable to join us. Uh, the paper is entitled Referendum Safeguarding Basic Constitutional Values. Is it visible? Yep. Yes, uh, a very good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and good evening as well. So I will be dealing on referendum safeguarding basic constitutional values. Now, when I'm starting with this topic, the first thing which I would like to discuss is how important it is for the countries to adopt global values. Let's not talk about the national values or what our constitution protects, human rights. Let's keep them aside for a second and talk about the global values, which are given in different international treaties, which are given in universal declaration of human rights. What these global values talk about or what these global values say, these values gives the utmost respect and dignity to the human rights. And when we talk about these international conventions, we want to see how our constitutions adopt these principles. So there are certain different ways in which different countries adopt these global values. Now, when we talk about these ways, one of the ways is judicial mandate, where the judiciary of a nation incorporates global values in case laws where they say that it is not the national values which are important, but it is the global human rights which should be there in the constitution. 
which the judiciary give preference while interpreting the case law second area is where the constitutions prohibit certain kind of amendments where those amendments which are happening in the nation where they infringe global values where they infringe international law where they infringe human rights in that case they cannot such amendments which violate these principles cannot be done in a country so this is also one of the ways to which countries adopt these global values like swiss constitution and when we come out about the third aspect which is where all the organs of the state respect the global values it is the parliament it is the judiciary it is the executives each organ is respecting the global values which we can see in the bosnia constitution now the fourth head which comes is referendum in some countries the global values the global human rights are adopted through the referendum their constitution protects that not only their constitution but the people in the form of direct democracy they vote on these global values we see certain examples recently example of right to equality example of same sex marriage lgbt rights different countries adopting different principles through the referendum and when we talk about these principles first we need to understand what referendum is how referendum works what are the ways which referendum are binding and which referendum are not binding on a country so when we see what referendum is so referendum can be defined as a direct democracy direct vote where people of the country they directly take part on the main issues issues of national importance now when we talk about this direct democracy it is on the other parallel sign parallel lines to the participatory democracy where people choose their representatives and representatives vote on the laws they pass the law but that is not the case in referendum there the people are directly voting on those laws whether those laws should be there or whether those laws should be repealed now it can be done in two ways one we have mandatory referendum and the other is optional so in case of mandatory referendum like we see in the case of russian constitution there are certain principles in russian constitution which can be amended only after there is a referendum so once amendment goes lower house and the upper house passes that amendment after that they require voting on those principles because here they are changing the basic constitutional values so they require a referendum to vote on that change this is a mandatory referendum where constitution is saying that you need referendum even if you are going for a basic change or amendment the second is optional referendum what happens in the case of optional referendum is that where we can say it is not mandatory constitution doesn't provide that but people can opt for that or the government can opt for that to give more legitimacy to their decision showing that not only governments wants this but also people are supporting this move of the government so it is a kind of optional referendum now when we come about the changes we see in different constitution recently in 2020 there was a referendum which was passed in russia now this recent referendum changed a lot of core principles of the russian constitution chapter 1 chapter 2 and chapter 9 of russian constitution cannot be changed it can be only changed by amendment which is supported by 3/5 of the lower house as a state of duma upper house federation council and plus after that the people votes 50% of people votes on that referendum on that amendment and then that amendment can be done and this happened in 2020 now one of the provisions of amendment says that same sex marriage is prohibited in the state of russia so no equality 
LGBT rights gone? Clearly, they are prohibiting LGBT rights. Now, when we talk about one example of Russia, there are some other countries which are pre preserving these values, basic values, equality. And this is one of the example of Swiss Civil Code, where a referendum was moved on 18 December 2020, which got the support and which said that same sex marriage is allowed in the state of, in the country of Swiss. So there was a turnout and most of the people favored that we can have equality. And one of the basic tenets of equality is we are not seeing the gender. For same sex marriage, you're not required to see the gender. It's like love can be to anyone. And so we support equality. So there's a same sex marriage and they allowed that. Now, one of the such cases was also reflected in 2008 in the case of Costa Rica. In Costa Rica in 2008, there was an amendment and that amendment talked about that Costa Rica is particularly prohibiting this same-sex marriage. So again, they passed a referendum and hold such law which was prohibiting same-sex marriage as unconstitutional. Now, this is one of the aspects of equality, which we can see all these three examples of Costa Rica and uh, Switzerland, how they use this referendum to protect these basic constitutional values of equality. And on the other side, one country like Russia we have and how they have neglected the rights of e equality. Now, another case which we see recently, this is 2021 case in the uh, Slovenian constitution. What happened in Slovenia was that they passed a law. The amendment was passed in 2016. And this amendment said that in, Slo in Slovenia, the industries can build their hotels, they can build buildings, they can do construction on the river banks. Now, as we know that Slovenia is, they have a good resource of water. And this was clearly infringing the environmental rights. This was in a way endangering the ecology. Now, what happened? The people of Slovenia got to the streets. We are going for a referendum. You cannot destroy the environment. Right to clean drinking water, right to water is a basic constitutional value. And we are going to change this amendment, which is clearly violating the right to clean environment and right to water, right to water. So again, we saw a referendum in case of Slovenia, where the people voted against this amendment. And this amendment was struck down through this referendum. So when we see all this, we just come to the conclusion that our referendum in the recent times has served as a need for a constitutional change. And this change talks about preserving the basic constitutional values, right to life, right to liberty, right to clean environment, right to equality, and how these referendums have been used. We can say in the some countries in a positive way, which has helped the people to get their basic rights in some countries, Again, this can be seen a clear example where you can say some parties have abused these processes of referendum. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't even have to send a uh, time cue to you. That's great. Um, with uh, with that in mind, we can now move over to uh, his Hinder's paper entitled Legislative Control Over Delegated Legislation, an Analysis of Multi-Jurisdictional Positions and the Way Forward. Thank you. Just before we start, I wanted to I once again clarify the time that I have. Oh, you're in mute. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yep, sorry, I, that was too fast. Yeah, if you can keep to 15, that'd be fantastic. I'll give you a cue at 14, uh, but I won't cut you off until you go a couple minutes over that. All right, thank you. Just, just give me a minute to share my presentation. Um, I hope this is visible, just give me a minute. I'll see a thumbs up, thank you. Uh, 
Okay, so I will start. So a warm greetings, everyone. I am Tejas Hinder. I mean, I'm sorry, just want to clarify again, if, if you see the presentation or... All right. We can. All right. Uh, right. Well, greetings, everyone. I am Tejas Hinder, and I am a penultimate year student of law of the LLB Honors at National Law Institute University, Bhopal. Sensing a concern of wide delegation of power, which has happened arbitrarily, which is many at many points in time, uh, you know, allowed for enactment on on various subject matters uh, in an unfettered manner, without uh, an explicit, uh, without an explicit, and without a recognized basis for a lower uh, for a lower for a lower uh, you know state based state level organization or a low or a local level organization uh, affiliated to the gov affiliated to the government of india i i believe that addressing this topic wide uh, cross ju cross jurisdiction study became a necessity and uh, which is why i think the the entire process of delegated legislation and the control of the main law, uh, the lawmaking body, which is the legislature, has to be looked at. Uh, I think that said, moving on into what uh, the concrete objectives that I had writing this paper. On the first front, uh, well, the parliamentary control over delegated legislation, as we look at it, should be a living community, should be a living continuity, and that is something I did not oppose. And it it should exist as a constitutional remedy. And the fact that delegate, delegation of legislative power has become too broad by this fact, the judicial control has struck, giving away to desirability and necessity of parliamentary control. And that's where the problem has arisen. The parliamentary control in India is not very effective and needs to be strengthened like that in UK, wherein we see the 1946 Act. Taking the example of the United Kingdom on a pretext or, or as a base in moving into this presentation, the UK, in the UK, the laying off procedure is followed effectively because they're all, because they're all administrative rulemaking is subjected to the control of the parliament through select committee on statutory instruments. In India, there is no such statutory provision, unfortunately, regarding laying of delegated legislation, which should be taken, which is what should be taken into consideration. That is what I look forward to highlight. That is what I look forward to highlight in this paper. Strengthening, uh, I'm sorry, moving on in regard to uh, what further motivated me as a pretext that I kept in mind while writing this paper. Uh, well, I think on a grassroots level, the aim of this research was to understand the various legislative control mechanisms over delegated legislations that are in practice in the United States, in India and the United Kingdom to make sure that this cross jurisdiction study yields prospective results and, uh, a similar, and similar practices in these foreign jurisdictions, of course. And the research initiated an in-depth analysis of various procedures of legislative control over delegated legislation as practiced in India and subsequently moves on to discuss various best practices in the world, which I, which I do in the penultimate part of my paper. And then in the ultimate part, I provide concrete recommendations, which shall be uh, the pre-concluding and concluding part of my presentation, respectively. Coming into getting a bit of pretext on what exactly, uh, you know, uh, is is parliamentary control and why does you know legislative control become a concept that has to be understood? On a, on a, on a basic note, it is oh, it, it has always been open to uh, law making bodies, uh, at least the three countries that I have taken for the purposes of this study, to uh, you know to uh, confer upon anyone it likes the powers to which uh, the powers which it has. Uh, but of the parliament delegates legislative powers to any other authority that is the executive. It must ensure that those powers are properly exercised by the admin, by the administration, and there is no misuse of such powers by the executive. And parliamentary control over this form of delegated legislation should be a living continuity as a constitutional necessity, as has been pointed out. The underlying and purpose of this very objective of parliamentary control is to keep a watch over the rulemaking authorities. And if there is an excess of power exercised or there is an abuse, it provides an opportunity to the parliament to criticize them. And this is what we look at as a on, a on a conceptual terminology as a legislative veto. And it becomes very important for the legislature to keep a close watch on the functions of uh, on the functions and power of the executive since the risk of power by the executive is inherent in the process of delegated legislation. Uh, and the fact uh, that, like I'd mentioned with regard to the complete sideline of judicial control, the fact that judicial control over delegated legislation is not sufficient enough to keep administrative agencies within the boundaries of delegation. And there is a, brings about an urgent need and necessity which the parliament may be able to exercise effectively. 
that is the parliament should or uh, if i could call it a the law making bodies on all four, on all four fronts should primarily be motivated by an aim to control at the time of passing of a, any parent act and control when legislature scrutinizes the, or the law making body scrutinizes this form of delegation the delegated legislation uh, i think on the next front what i'd want to deal with is what exactly are this means and forms of parliamentary control that are being referred to and in the presentation as you see point 2 uh, it's direct control and indirect control direct control is something that you see in all three countries and indirect control is something that you see unofficially practiced in india but only has a statutory basis while a guideline and a rule book followed by the law making body or that the central level that is the parliament of india so on the direct control on the indian position you see uh, you know through debate on the act which contains legislative delegation through questions and notices through moving resolutions and notices in the house to maybe veto on ground or through even a private members bill if i were to point that out and the procedure that is followed is what we call a laying procedure in india that is the second uh, link in the chain of legislative control which comes into play after the rules are made uh, is achieved by this laying procedure and this technique involves invoking legislative supervision of delegated legislation as a provision in the delegating statute and hence requiring laying of the rules before the legislation and this is done again by two sub formulas a simple laying formula and an affirmative resolution and to very quickly give one liners for for the purposes of our understanding a simple laying formula which says that the rules must be laid uh, before the law making body and affirmative resolution because uh, which says and it, it should envisage the rules to be laid uh, before the legislature but to remain effective they must be approved by the house coming over to the united kingdom before uh, and the united states uh, wide direct control before moving on towards looking at indirect control and then the shortcoming in the united kingdom uh, much delegated legislation takes the form of statutory instruments that is there is a drafting manual and annual volumes of statutory instruments that are which are published and the parent that may give either house the power to disallow a statutory instrument and in uh, and further the technique of laying is very extensively used in england because i'm sorry in the united kingdom because the administrative delegation is subject to the supervision of the parliament under the statutory instruments act of 1946 which prescribes a concrete timetable and the most common forms of provision provide the delegated legislation come uh, comes into immediate effect but is subject to annulment by an advance resolution of either house so the uk lastly also occasionally uses an unusual type of affirmative resolution uh, under which a delegated instrument comes into immediate effect but must be approved by an affirmative resolution of each house within 40 days that's it about uk within the united states uh, the control of the congress over delegated legislation is highly i'm sorry the governing body is highly uh, limited because neither uh, neither is the technique of laying extensively used there nor is there any congressional committee to scrutinize it it is regulated by the reorganization acts of 1939 and 19 uh, and 1939 to 1969 the, the two fundamental questions then arise for consideration on the basis of which we need to work which is a what is the legality of this form of laying and b i mean if if taken if 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 taken in foresight and b legal consequences of non compliance with any sort of laying provisions at any point so i think on the first level uh, in a simple laying formula failure to lay the rules do not affect their legal validity that is even if statutory provision says that a uh, rule shall be laid it remains directly and the use of the word shall doesn't make it mandatory if we were to go by any uh, you know uh, any interpretation of statute or uh, based authority be it a case law or be it an author and nevertheless the responsibility remains and regulations are are made and not not to be adhered to for you know by the law making body for for quite some time uh i think moving on what we are to understand is reasons to support the view that laying pro laying provisions are mandatory that is uh, you know laying provisions forms part of the general publication requirement and requirement is an exercise by the law making body of its right to check uh, the action of its legislative delegate and that's the whole and sole means by which this legal legalization can be looked at in foresight but has no concrete recognition or statutory recognition um, like in section 42 of the statutory instruments act of 1946 in the united kingdom we then come to legal consequences of non compliance so under section 42 of the 1946 act in the united kingdom 
uh, legal lien provisions are made mandatory for the validation of statutory instruments. In India, however, the consequences of the non-compliance, the lien provisions depend on whether the provisions in the Enabling Act are mandatory and directory. Uh, and if I were to quote a few cases that we see in India and otherwise, uh, in India, we had a very famous case called Narendra Kumar versus Union of India, wherein the Apex Court held that provisions of a certain act which provided, uh, you know, which pro which granted uh, a, a lawmaking power in order to amend it or in order to, uh, uh, you know, take decision on the scope of implementation of the act, uh, held that, uh, you know, the rules, any rules that are framed by the parliament under such act uh, are should be made mandatory if read with the act. And therefore, clause four of, uh, and therefore, clause four of the impugned legislation has no effect until and unless it's made, made before such lawmaking bodies. And this, this puts us to three quick fundamental points. Uh, all acts of any lawmaking body should uniformly require that rules be laid on the table of the House as soon as possible. The laying procedure should uniformly be 30 days from the date of final publication. And the rule will be subject to such modifications as the House may like to make. And this is the primary level of suggestions that come here. Uh, moving, take, taking a minute more to stress on the issues that exist more in this, that exists more in this regard. Uh, now we've looked at how, uh, how, the, how the system particularly works and how judicial review is impugned. Uh, judicial review, talking of judicial review, laying procedure does not exclude judicial review of delegated legislation in uh, the states in India. Laying of rules has no effect on their legal validity and it confers no sanctity or immunity and has no impact on the doctrine of ultraviolence. So when the rules are required to be laid before the legislature, they continue to remain subject to the ultraviolence doctrine and that's where it gets problematic. And the mere fact that a notification is required to be laid before the parliament makes no difference as regards the jurisdiction of uh, the court to pronounce on its validity as we've seen. I think these being the fundamental problems that have been highlighted, I'd want to talk about three quick pointers on failures and highlight the recommendations that I make in my paper. So failure to lay in UK and India is the first and foremost point. That is, uh, say in England, we saw the case of Bailey versus Williamson, wherein the condition of laying was held directory. And however, the situation has changed after passing the after passing of the 1946 Act, and there was a case of R versus Sheer Metal Craft, wherein uh, wherein it was held that delegated legislation, I, I believe, became valid only after it was laid before the Parliament. And likewise, uh, you know, on similar lines in India, there was a case of uh, Express Newspaper Private Limited versus Union of India, where the Supreme Court observed by way of obiter dicta that uh, the provision regarding laying was mandatory. However, there did come a subsequent case to it, which is Indri Kerala Education Bill 1957, uh, when the Supreme Court said that after the rules are laid before the Legislative Assembly, they may be altered or amended. And it is then that the rules as amended become effective. So with these being the problems and these being the direct and indirect mechanisms, what is it that lies in the form of recommendations? Uh, I just, uh, I'll just switch the slide. I apologize. Uh, right. So I think we have four fundamental points in addressing the way forward. And those four fundamental points are uh, in, in synchrony with uh, the problems that we've, the three broad problems that we've highlighted. That is courts have placed an undue emphasis on being procedure, which is, uh, informational in nature and it triggers no automatic control mechanism in the legislature and even as an informational mechanism its efficacy is doubtful and if an affirmative vote is needed in the house to effectuate the rules the government will take the necessary steps to effectuate the same but if the laying is coupled with a negative vote it is inconceivable uh, that the government will let the house negative the rule i'm sorry negate the rules made by the government and uh, the court the courts in the, in the cases that I just mentioned have attributed an exaggerated importance to the laying provisions. Uh, and yes, I think the recommendations are number one, the, uh, the lawmaking bodies, that is the respective lawmaking houses, uh, should neither time nor expertise to control the administration, which has grown in volume as well as complexity. The legislative leadership should lie with the executive and it, as it plays a significant role in formulating policies. Uh, or, or any executing body. Third, uh, the, the majority support enjoyed uh, by the executive in the lawmaking body should reduce the possibility of effective criticism. Uh, fourthly, 
uh, the growth of delegated legislation uh, should reduce the role of the law making bodies in making detailed laws and increase powers of bureaucracy fifth uh, well i think the lack of strong and steady oppositions if 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 in existence in law making bodies should contribute to the ineffectiveness in legislative control over administration and over administration and lastly uh, there is no automatic as we know there is no automatic machinery for the effective scrutiny on behalf of the parliament as a whole and the quantity and complexity are such that it is no longer possible to rely on such scrutiny so i believe all in all what we could definitively say is that with the growing nations and more functions to be performed by the legislation i'm sorry by the legislature or the law making body and thereby delegating its functions to the executive is equally grave to be taken into consideration uh, it is also therefore of utmost importance that there should be proper control on exercise of legislative power by the executive and there are certain safeguards which are laid down to be followed which operate at two levels firstly as i mentioned when the legislature is delegating such power in the favor of executive and secondly there should be control mechanism so that the power is not abused by the executive and that brings me to my two final conclude two final points with which i'd like to end my presentation uh i think believe power of judicial review which since i made a mention of that uh, should not be taken away or curtailed by any rules that are that come with such main procedure any financial levy or tax should, and and any financial levy or tax i believe should not be imposed by the rules that that would amount to mere abuse and hence violate uh, you know any doctrine of ultra and ultra wise which is something that exists as a loophole in this very process and then on the final point sub delegation in very wide language is improper and some safeguards must be provided before a delegate is allowed to sub delegate his authority to another functionary and uh, the final authority of interpretation of rules should not be with the administration uh and that brings me to my end to the end of my presentation and i thank you for listening uh, if there are any questions i'd be happy to take them Thank you. Before we get to questions, we do have one more uh, talk, which will by, be by Christian Stemberg on clawbacks in Germany and the United States. Yes, uh, thanks a lot and uh, good evening from uh, Germany. As you may see here, it's already already getting dark, so uh, I hope I'm not too tired to, to give the presentation, but it, uh, it should all work out. Um, I'm a research associate as the at the Max Planck Institute for Comparative and International Private Law in Hamburg and uh, the presentation today is about clawbacks uh, which is a device used in corporate law and um, although I think most of you probably are not corporate lawyers or not that uh, probably not expert in, in the field of corporate law I'm pretty sure you are uh, familiar with uh, the whole discussion uh, surrounding executive, uh, executive compensation. Most of the time, people complain about excessive managing manager salaries. Uh, people denounce them and say they are too high. They want a cap on conversation. And a lot of the times, there are three points uh, that are made um, why they are too high and why there's a problem. One is that focus is often placed on short-term successes of the company, and uh, those can be detrimental in the long term. This is called selling the future. Second, there's often incentive for managers to falsify financial statements and engage in so-called window dressing to receive higher bonuses that are actually unearned. And thirdly, uh, there's not really a way to appropriately respond to uh, misconduct by managers, except maybe fire them, but that's uh, oftentimes the company does not want to do that. So uh, what we are, we'll look at today is, uh, when we look at clawbacks is actually a timeline. We will visit those three legislative acts, two of them starting in the United States. That's where clawbacks uh, got first introduced. And then we will look at three examples of three ways how they may have been introduced or may not have been introduced in Germany. And uh, I hope that we can uh, talk about whether we can talk of clawbacks as a legal transplant or not. 
for that, since the topic, topic of clawbacks is maybe a little bit exotic and not everyone, not even corporate lawyers know what, what a clawback is all the time, um, we'll first talk a little bit about clawbacks in general, then we will visit the United States and after that Germany and try to compare, compare both countries. First of all, clawbacks in general, what are clawbacks? Clawbacks are uh, a way of recouping variable manager remuneration. That's what we call bonuses. And they can be recouped even after they have been paid out to the managers. That's something that usually is not so easy to do, but with the instrument of a clawback, it's possible. Why is that important? Or what is important when we talk about clawbacks? First, it's always only variable remuneration that is recouped, not the base salary, only the bonus that goes on top of it. Then it's recouped from executives. It's not like the usually company worker. It's always high ranking people like the CEO, the CFO or other board members or other executives. Then it's always remuneration that already has been paid out to them. If it, if it hasn't been paid out already, there are other ways to, to the company can just keep it. They don't have to take it back. That's what makes clawback special that you can take it back. Um, by this taking back of the remuneration, um, there's a, a psychological effect that comes into play, the so-called loss aversion. That's something we say like, Bonuses are an incentive for, for CEOs, CFOs, for managers to behave a certain way. But people say clawbacks are even strong, a stronger incentive because you want to keep what you have earned. You don't want to have it taken back from you. And uh, to sum it up, you could say clawbacks attach a string to variable remuneration and later you can pull it back. Um, then let's get into a, a little typology of clawbacks. First, there are statutory clawbacks and contractual clawbacks. Statutory clawbacks are clawbacks by law. Yeah? It's, a, it's a legal norm. It does not require an act of implementation into the contract. It works as itself. And it's enforced either by the state or by the company itself. Both is possible. On the other hand, contractual clawbacks, uh, they are what we call the clawback clauses. Uh, and you put them in executives' contracts. And they have to be enforced by the company, usually by the company's board. On the other hand, we can distinguish between mandatory and voluntary clawback clauses. So now we only talk about the contractual clawbacks. Mandatory clawback clauses are prescribed by law. So there's a law that tells the company you have to implement them into the contracts with your, with your executives, otherwise you will get some sort of punishment. Voluntary clawback clauses, on the other hand, there's no law that tells the company to do so or forces it. It's in, their introduction is at the discretion of each company and they can decide whether to introduce them or not. However, there is pressure from investors, from voting advisors, from remuneration advisors to introduce clawback clauses, or there may be. And there may also be, and that's maybe a, a, a connex to, to one of the talks earlier, they may also be soft law. And we will visit an example of soft law that puts pressure on companies to introduce a clawback. Uh, then how is the clawback constructed? Yeah. Like a lot of norms, it consists of a trigger and a legal consequence. Um, the legal consequence for clawbacks is mostly similar. It's an obligation to repay to the company all or part of the variable, variable remuneration. But the trigger, it can vary widely. And it also has a strong effect of, on the purpose of the clawback. Uh, we, in Germany, it's really a German distinction. I'm, it's, it's not really uh, made in the US, but we distinguish between performance clawbacks and compliance clawbacks. Performance clawbacks are based on objective circumstances relating to the company. So maybe the financial statements, maybe bad performance or something else. Compliance clawbacks, on the other hand, they focus on manager's behavior. So there's always uh, an attachment to how the manager behaves. And they can formulate a trigger like breach of duty or violation of the company's code of conduct. 
Now let's uh, get to the United States. Let's dive in and see what are the rules in the United States states concerning clawbacks. First, in 2002, we have the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Maybe some of you know a company that was called Enron and uh, the so-called Enron scandal. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act is a direct reaction of the government to this scandal. Uh, Enron and other companies such as Adelphi or Tyco or WorldCom, they all pretty much did the same thing. They published financial, re financial report that portrayed their financial situation much better than it actually was. And this led to huge bonuses paid to the managers. But after that, they, uh, they had to correct their statements and uh, the stocks plummeted, the uh, companies went bankrupt, but the, uh, the managers could keep the compensation. There was no way to get it back, at least no easy way. And there was a huge uproar, a public uproar about that. Um, they, were, they were seen as re really, really unfair. And uh, so in the Sarbanes Oxley Act, there was a, uh, there was a part con uh, introduced or a part uh, combined into it that introduced such an, a clawback. The important thing is it's a statutory clawback. So it's not, uh, not, a, claw, not a clawback clause that is introduced in the uh, contracts with the CEOs, but it's a legal norm that works as itself. No need to introduce it whatsoever into contracts. It works as itself. And uh, the trigger for this clawback is a restatement as a result of misconduct. That led to lots of uh, discussion and lots of controversy because a lot of people ask whose misconduct is it? Is it the company's misconduct in total or maybe the CEO's or CFO's uh, misconduct? Do we need a personal misconduct? And uh, the uh, courts answered it in the case SEC v. Jenkins and they said it's the company's misconduct. It's a misconduct at some level in the company. It doesn't need to be the CEO's or CFO's personal fault. They have to overview the whole company. So this is why it's a performance clawback, which is surprising maybe because the wording misconduct really sounds like it's a compliance clawback, but it's a performance clawback because it's not linked to the, to the at least not directly to the behavior of CEO or CFO. And uh, the legal consequence of this clawback is really, really strict. It's the repayment of the entire variable remuneration during one year. And it's a total loss. Everything's gone. This is really, really a strong, uh, a, a strong reaction. And uh, this is why this uh, clawback is also called sledgehammer. Because once it's swung, it really has a huge effect. And uh, important is enforcement is here not done by the company, it's done by the SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission, which has oversight about, about all uh, publicly traded uh, companies in the US. And that also led to some problems because the SEC didn't really uh, use this sledgehammer very often. There are very, very few cases where the, where the SEC used a clawback. A second clawback was introduced in 2010 with the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. You see Barack Obama uh, uh, signing it into action. Um, it's a direct reaction, again, to a scandal, to a problem, to a crisis, to the global financial crisis. Um, however, the rules in the Dodd-Frank Act that uh, concern clawbacks have not yet been put into action because they, they still require a uh, a guideline from the SEC that has to be put forward, and it's been more than 10 years now, it's still not in action yet. Um, however, it has, of course, some effect because a lot of companies uh, still uh, use clawbacks uh, or try to use clawbacks in advance and introduce them before this comes into action. The trigger in this act is it's just a restatement. No misconduct needed, so this is clearly a performance clawback. Legal consequence here is much more limited than uh, with the SOX. It's only uh, excess pay, only 
that pay that you wouldn't have earned with the direct with the correct figures with the correct financial statements only that payment that you you got in excess of it only this you have to repay um, therefore it covers much more people not only cfo or ceo but uh, all executive officer officers and that's around 10 people uh, per company also uh, enforcement i have to say of the dot frank act is done by the company. It's not by the SSC, it's the company itself has to do, introduce the clawback into the contracts and has to enforce it. This may be, uh, oh, sorry uh, to, uh, so you can remember it more easily, the sledgehammer and the other one is more excess pay. Um, I will skip the voluntary clawbacks, which is the third line in the US just to uh, for for time purposes so i can talk a little bit about uh, clawbacks in germany um first of all there's no general statutory clawback in germany like the socks we don't have that we have it we have only a, a very limited general statutory clawback and that's for financial institutions or uh, let's yeah but the, the one is more like actually more like the dot frank because it's uh, also not a statutory clawback it's a clawback a mandatory clawback clause that those institutions banks basically big banks have to introduce but only for so-called risk takers for people who when they deal uh, with money and um, and the fate of the bank they have a lot of risk in what they do which is ceo cfo and high ranking officials of the bank it has two different tri triggers, which are two compliance clawbacks. Compliance clawbacks, yeah. They are linked to the directly linked to the behavior of those executives. One is that an, if, an, if a manager has been significantly involved in or responsible for significant losses of the bank, which is actually performance element. So we see a little bit of a uh, combination of both uh, types of clawbacks, but it's still it's uh, compliance clawbacks because it requires action. Of the, of the manager. And the second one is serious violation or relevant external or against rel of relevant external or internal regulations with regard to suitability or conduct. So this is clearly a compliance clawback because the serious violation of the manager. Um, the legal consequence here is very similar to SOX. It's loss of all, of the complete loss of var variable remuneration, so also very strict legal consequence, but it's enforced by the institution, like Dodd Frank. So it's more like a, also like a mixture maybe of it has the legal consequence of SOX, and it has the enforcement of Dodd Frank. Um, and then quickly to other uh, laws, on the the one is the German Corporate Governance Codex, which is pretty interesting here because it's a soft law. It's it's not introduced by the state, but by a commission in Germany. And it doesn't have strict requirements, but it works uh, with comply or explain. It's you either comply with the, the, the rules of the corporate governance codex, or you explain why you don't. And uh, it contains a recommendation towards the introduction of clawback for all publicly traded companies. But it's, it's wording is in justified cases. So it doesn't say if you have to introduce a compliance or a performance clawback. So it's very unclear, but still it's of course pressure to introduce a clawback. And then there's the ARUG 2, which is uh, the German act implementing the European Second Shareholders Rights Directive. It's uh, based on European law and it doesn't have a requirement for clawback clauses, but it's at least forces uh, the company to make a decision whether to introduce a clawback or not. So we have to at least um, talk about it internally, and you have to put it to a vote, an advisory vote to the uh, to the general assembly. Uh, again, I will uh, skip the voluntary clawbacks, or maybe uh, there's a rise in voluntary clawbacks. Now we have 39% of the biggest. German companies that have a voluntary clawback. So it's really becoming a big trend in Germany, maybe because of the soft law, maybe because of pressure by investors. And uh, because of this, I personally think that there will be no uh, new actions by the state or by the government because they will wait 
for uh, the voluntary clawback first to 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 grow and uh, for companies to get more accustomed to it. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, I only overstepped slightly. I hope. Uh, I think we still have a little bit time for a Q and A. Uh, and if you have any uh, thoughts about it, please feel free to message me, or maybe we can talk about it in the upcoming discussion. Thank you. Thanks. That was very clear and very close to being right on time. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, we started late and we made it, we, we went a little long, but not too bad. We do still have some time for questions. We're a uh, reasonably small group. So uh, what I will say is that given that there's so many presenters, feel free to ask each other questions, right? Um, and what we'll do is I will moderate um, the discussion. We can use the raise hand feature. That would be excellent. Um, as you formulate your questions, I'll just note that um, it is perhaps uh, difficult to formulate one question that's go for me to pose one question that's going to go across this disparate uh, um, set of papers, although it's interesting that there are some affinities, right? We do see um, the broad range of regulatory tools that we have available to us and the broad range of tools we have, uh, w options we have for their different forms. Um, and it, I think it does ask us to step back and reflect on, you know, which tools are appropriate for which purposes. Um, another thing to note as we go through is how in looking at these papers, we're always adjacent to some of the classical questions in comparative law, right? What are the appropriate comparators? Is it better to do a classic UK, US uh, analysis or, um, you know, what can we really learn from countries like Slovenia that we often don't pay close close attention to in comparative law? I think we saw there are things we can learn, but we can ask ourselves questions about when are these the appropriate types of questions to ask and when not? And then I think something operating in the background across these papers too is this thing that uh, Prabri uh, made very explicit, but I think was in the background throughout, is this relationship between the global and the global, the transnational and the local constitutionalism, right? Um, should, to what extent should our, uh, comparisons be indexed to international norms, but also to what extent should our uh, particular choices that we make be reflective of international or transnational norms? I think all of these questions um, are at least adjacent to the particular questions that uh, were raised in your uh, papers. Um, so with that, sort of broad commentary of reflection on mine, I'm going to turn it over to Athena to ask our first question. Thank you. So my question uh, comes first uh, to uh, Mr. Uh, Stenbeck from Germany. I live in Germany too. I'm very glad to hear your lecture. Um, the question is, um, could uh, we uh, find uh, some binding elements uh, in the future or nowadays, uh, or could we combinate in the future anti-corruption strategies with clawbacks in Germany? First question. Second question comes to uh, uh, Ms. Parta Zarati. Uh, thank you for the very interesting uh, uh, narration and um, the topic is, is, is very interesting. Um, my problem is how can we discern from interpretative rules of international conventions you used as soft law, and you talked about soft law, uh, you enumerated under soft law uh, sources, um, you used the interpretative uh, actions, uh, the preparation, preparatory works of international treaties, um, should we make here um, a distinction because preparatory works were used as interpretative uh, tools? We try to find uh, what was the intention uh, when the words in the treaties are not clear. And of course, uh, ICJ had used uh, uh, these documents. Uh, should we make a more strict enumeration of what soft law is, what is its usage, and what is general interpretative tool. And second problem is, of course, what you said at the end, effects of soft law. In that point, 
I find that soft law is not effective enough for companies. Uh, we cannot uh, um, obli oblige a company to comply with environmental standards only by soft law. So what can we do in the future to attribute to soft law more uh, a quasi obligational character? Thank you very much to all others. I can't uh, take more attention and time at now. Thank you. question about the maybe other uses of clawbacks and I think there's there's already maybe some connection actually to uh, to corruption because um, if, a, if a company introduces a, a compliance clawback it can it can say oh it's triggered if you um, act against our code of conduct and if that code of conduct has something in it about uh, anti-corruption then uh, we already have this link. Um, but it's, 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 it would be possible that a, uh, that a rule maker, that lawmakers uh, also say, okay, we want to have a stronger anti-corruption law, let's combine it with clawbacks. That would be possible. But however, I have to say, um, I didn't address that in my presentation because it's uh, uh, it would have uh, gone, too, gone too far. That was merely like a, a general overview on clawbacks. Um, it's not, I, I talked about loss aversion um, as one of the, the, the thoughts behind clawbacks, but it's not entirely clear yet if clawbacks work and how they work. And if they maybe work in ways that we don't want them to. So we, there, there's a lot of economic um, research going on around that topic at the moment, but it's not quite clear if it's an effective way to, uh, to use for such a, uh, uh, such a specific topic. Because like a lot of people say, the, uh, the, the manager, he signs the, uh, the, he signs the contract and then he forgets what's in it. So he, he doesn't always think about, oh, I have this clawback clause, so I, I have to be careful with corruption. So maybe the maybe the linkage between behavior and uh, the clawback is not as strong as we would like it to be. So before we we use it as a broader corporate governance instrument, we may have to revisit that uh, first. Um, should I go next? Um, I I'll probably answer the first the second question first. Um, the second question was about how we ensure compliance because soft law isn't uh, effective enough. Is Was that the question? Um, yeah, so uh, I agree that soft law isn't really effective in that sense. Um, but I think the examples that I chose, that of Nestle and BP, um, are examples where most of the industry has sort of uh, adopted the soft law standard and it's become like a stamp of currency. But uh, that level of, uh, so compliance is ensured only when everyone else, that is all the other players in the industry have adopted that particular soft law standard. So in a situation where say uh, Nestle doesn't comply or BP doesn't comply, there is a lot of outrage. But generally soft law is not so well complied with. Reputation is probably the only important check that I can think of in terms of ensuring that uh, corporations comply. But um, again, corporations are using like very innovative ways of sort of coming up with their own soft law standards and then complying with those standards. An example is in the area of artificial intelligence where a bunch of, um, where I was recently attending a talk on ethical AI and whether it's possible to have ethical AI where a lot of uh, companies themselves are evolving these uh, standards for ethical AI or funding other organizations that evolve these standards for ethical AI and then claiming to comply. So soft law is, uh, to put it, I mean, I'm pretty skeptical about the ability of soft, soft law to effectuate change. So uh, I'm, I'm a skeptic. I'm not sure what we need to do to ensure compliance, but soft law so far has been used as an excellent uh, publicity tool by corporations. Compliance, I don't know when that's going to happen. So I would probably push for hard regulation rather than soft law, but jurisdictional issues may arise and a bunch of problems with hard law, but 
uh, soft law is definitely not the way to go. Um, with respect to the first question, which was about interpretive uh, ways of understanding soft law. So the definition of soft law that I used for the purpose of my paper was uh, proposed by Abbott and Stendhal. Uh, they have a paper on hard and soft law. And um, I, so in my paper, I didn't clearly differentiate between soft law that was drafted by international organizations as well as self-drafted soft law. So I used a very uh, sort of loose definition of soft law. I perhaps should have been more specific in um, defining soft law, um, but um, in terms of understanding soft law, there are just so many ways to understand it. Something that's drafted by the organization or a group of organizations or something like uh, something drafted by the UN or UN General Assembly resolution. So I've taken a broad definition in my paper. Perhaps I need to narrow it down and be more clear about how to define it. I think those are my answers. Thank you. Right. Uh, Professor Singh, you want to ask a question of one of your panelists, co-panelists? Yes, my question to is uh, to Jesse. Um, I've seen certain uh, legislations on uh, fake news because this had been a lot of problem and even WHO termed it as infodemic uh, during pandemic. A lot of countries faced a lot of problem regarding fake news. So uh, what's your see on the legislation which has been enacted by Singapore? Protection from Online Falsehood and Manipulation Act. Where they particularly target this uh, social boots, the fake accounts, and they have kept a penalty for those persons who are creating these fake accounts. And my second question is because uh, you rightly talked about that we are living in a technological era and it is very difficult to stop fake news. One of the reasons why most of the countries say is stopping those eco chambers where same fake news is flowing and from one eco chamber it goes to many platforms and many users because there is an eco chamber which has been created. So what you see on controlling this eco chambers because it, it is totally AI generated. And my third question is, uh, there are certain cases where this, when we are dealing these uh, platforms like Facebook and Twitter, they use AI to control this fake news and they will use the matchbox system where they will put certain words. If you use those words in your uh, tweets or in your comments, so you will not able to post those words or your tweet will be deleted. So in this case, you don't mean what you say, you have a different interpretation, but AI will delete your comment. And this will again have a chilling effect on your freedom of speech and expression. So what's your say on this? Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think the first question is about Singapore. Singapore is thinking to also set up a new law about this information because you, you might know Singapore is pretty small. Maybe you can say Singapore is a country, but it's more like a city. And there are so many, I honestly, there are some racial issue there. So I think Singapore just cannot take that kind of risk. So let's try to set up this kind of new law and try to, you know, that, uh, you know, try to achieve some kind of peaceful, you know, social order. So, but, but just like I say, uh, because Singapore is pretty small, so it's very easy they try to demonstrate this kind of law. But for some big countries, pretty hard. But I've just, I, I think to my knowledge, Singapore is still thinking about this, but it's unsuccessful because there are still some issue there. Okay, and the second issue, I think it's a little bit hard. I think it's more about uh, privacy because, you know, when AI tried to, you know, delete the information and all the things, they, they got the data, but the data is about the privacy. So uh, I don't know, I, I think Facebook now, they, they don't, actually they don't use, they just, they don't just depend on AI to address the disinformation issue. They hire so many people, try to filter some, you know, inappropriate uh, speech on their website. 
And they, if you have, have any question, you can appeal your case to the global oversight board. So I actually, I don't think AI is a good way to try to address the disinformation issue, but it's a very good way to deliver more disinformation. I mean, fake news. So this is, this is my, my perspective. But uh, I'm not sure if I answer your, answer your question, but yeah, that's it, thank you. Right, so we're right at the time, but I think in the interest, uh, we started late, so in the interest of allowing everybody to speak at least once, I'm gonna ask a question about delegation, um, and then we'll call it a day. Um, I guess I, one of the questions I had listening to the talk on delegation, and I actually read the paper previously, was to what extent is the problem delegation itself? So is your argument one that's about, that's going to say something like, you know, delegation is bad, but in a world where delegation is legally permissible, this is the type of thing we need to make sure that when it happens, it happens well, or is the problem really with just delegating what should be the authority of um, bodies that have clear and clearly and explicitly been given these powers? And then if it's a second best argument, is it best dealt with with these kind of institutional safeguards or is it best dealt with with having clear principles for when a delegation is allowed in the law um, as a means of um, ensuring that we don't have these bad cases of delegation? And sorry, I guess you have to be brief. It's a big question, uh, but I wanted to give you some opportunity to speak. Absolutely. So I think uh, just three quick pointers to answer that. Uh, like throughout my paper, my contention has been with regard to ensuring that there is a threshold based delegation, there is a legal form of delegation, of course. The fact that it stands as a legal, it stands as a legalized procedure, it stands as a means to, you know, it, it stands as a means to ensure that there is some sort of fe uh, federal structure maintained in order to ensure governance is something that I go with a hypothesis of when writing the paper. Now, delegation is something that I do say has to exist, but the means in which it has to, you know, the means in which it has to operate is something I mentioned has to be legislatively governed in India through, you know, specific laws and in the states. Now, uh, three points to this. Number one, where do the, where do the problems particularly arise? Now, when there are uh, statutory bodies, right, you have multiple statutory bodies other than uh, government organs, which have been specifically constituted. These can be ad hoc bodies. These can be general bodies that are broadly entrusted with a particular function, and they can be at the central and at the state level. Now, this can create two kinds of problems. Conflicts among the bodies themselves because of having a common subject matter and no, and no you know, differential mandate or no demarcated mandate. And at the second level, uh, overlap in function and you know there is a co and, and ultimately there coming a conflict with regard to what is being delegated from a central to a state or a state to a local uh, or state to a local body that is you know recognized by such statute so that is that is where the first fold of problem lies on this uh, so in order to modify that my suggestion was a define the rules explicitly and correctly b if there is if there are multiple bodies at different levels that are operating for a common purpose, the extent to which they can enact laws within the contours of the parent legislation and within the contours of the territory for which they are you know, working for has to be made explicit. And if there is any move beyond that, the same has to be penalized. That is what that is where I draw the example of the 1946 Act of the United Kingdom. And I did mention the case law of Williamson as well. And in India, again, the, the Hindu Times Act, uh, I'm sorry, the Times case was, uh, you know, largely based on the very ruling in the Williamson case. Now, on the second front, uh, I, uh, where the problem arises is, uh, you know, when, when this sort of delegation is particularly occurring, this is unfettered. Now, say in India, for example, uh, you, have, uh, you have a union state and concurrent list. Each of these laid out certain subject matters over which the state, the center, and both can enact laws. Uh, and I, yes, and I, uh, and in the States and the United Kingdom as well, each of these centralized bodies have, uh, you know, have certain functions on the basis of which they enact. But owing to the absence of, you know, specifically demarcated extent to which functions can be delegated, it can so happen that a central duty is legislated to a state. And maybe something that's in the concurrent list, which requires, a, or maybe, uh, which requires a center to act, 
is something that a state tends to act upon and you know it becomes specifically applicable to one state and hence results in conflicting with what the center says uh, center says so i think that delegation in itself becomes a bad delegation so that is the second problem and i think just wrapping it up the third and final problem is with regard to uh, you know how such delegation takes the form of bad delegation when this is unchecked now wh what do i what what do what did i say when i say check right uh, now you have certain trans tra you have certain transfer of power there is one parent statutory body there are multiple say subsidiary bodies or there are multiple uh, sub statutory bodies so there is delegation then there is sub delegation there are two levels of delegation so on the third level flowing from the first point the sub delegation in itself is something that eats into what has been delegated so what has been delegated from a state to a local body is something that may go beyond the territorial demarcation so that ultimately creates a conflict with regard to applicability so when there is such sort of excessive delegation that is created the very purpose gets defeated so i think that way the third problem is created so bad delegation has to not exist but delegation in itself has to exist as long as it, as long as its thresholds are defined the extent to which delegation has to happen over certain subject matters are defined and what the subject matters are and what each organization can delegate should also be defined and what the subject matters particularly are where they particularly stem from and uh, you know a version of these conflicts or, or on the basis of which laws are made over these subject matters uh, have to be ensured and has to i mean do not conflict is something that has to be ensured so this is this is uh, the extent to which I I do make my four five suggestions. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, I think we ended up uh, being on the amount of time we should have been. Apologies for having to be very uh, uh, dictatorial in some ways about timelines, and apologies also um, if I mispronounced anything along the way. The unfortunate thing about running behind is we didn't get to meet each other beforehand, um, and uh, if that introduced any errors on my part, I am seriously sorry. Um, I do hope, however, that we will see each other at future uh, ASCL and YCC meetings. This was fun, and I look forward to having more discussions for the rest of the day, and hopefully in the future. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.